Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is Website Design. So in this video, we're going to talk a bit about website design. And I want to focus mostly on branding. And so the idea behind branding is you want to make your website unique and clearly identifiable. And the idea here is if your website looks like everybody else's website, people aren't going to notice it. And let's say somebody emails a link to your website to one of their friends. And that friend visits that page, says, oh, this is pretty cool. And then the next day, somebody else sends a link to another page on your website to that same person. And what you want to have happen is when they click on that link, you want them to say, wait a minute, I think I've been to this website before. I recognize this website. This is a different page. But yeah, this is the same website I went to yesterday. This, this website seems to have some really cool stuff. I should be paying attention to this website. And so in this video, we're going to talk about some things that are going to help you make your website unique, identifiable, and interesting. Okay, so here are the four elements of branding we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about logo, briefly, uh, typography, uh, in, in particular font choices, and color schemes. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, overall layout and what you should be thinking in terms of navigation. All right, so the main thing I want to say about your logo is you need to make sure that your logo is clearly identifiable and appears on all your web pages, or at least some version. You can have a simplified version on the inner pages and then like a fancy version on, on the main home page. The thing to keep in mind here is that if you have a successful website, people are going to be doing what's called deep linking. And so that means is that people are going to be linking to individual pages deep within your website. I think one thing that many amateurs often think is that, oh, I'm just going to focus on the branding on the home page because everybody's going to be coming through the home page. And that is just not true. You know, if you think about uh, web page links that you've sent to friends, you know, there have probably been many times when you've been like, oh, here's a particular product uh, that's part of a larger website. I want to go ahead and send somebody a link to this, or here's a movie review, you know, and this is an inner page on a larger website. And so this is deep linking. And so always keep in mind, and we'll talk about this again when we're talking about navigation schemes, that people are not necessarily coming through the front door. So, you know, you need to have your website clearly identifiable from any one of the web pages. All right, so one of the key design choices you're going to be making for your website is what to use for font. And we're going to be talking about three fundamental font choices. Uh, and they are, you can use a sans serif font, a serif font, or a monospace font. And as we'll see when we take a look at real web pages, real web pages often use a mix of these. But, you know, most of them are primarily either sans serif or serif. Uh, monospace is uh, used for special purposes that we'll be talking about a little bit later. All right, so let's make sure everybody understands what these serifs are and what sans serif is. So on the left, I have a sans serif font, and on the right, I have a serif font. And those little tick marks uh, on the ends of uh, the F here, those are the serifs. So here's what the design people will tell you about serif versus sans serif fonts. Serif fonts are formal and authoritative. Although the flip side of that view is serif fonts are old fashioned and dowdy. And sans serif fonts are upbeat and contemporary. So you need to think about what the purpose of your website is and whether you'd rather be contemporary or authoritative when choosing your font. So let's take a look at some actual websites and see which one of these font choices they're making. So what do you think? Do you think the New York Times wants to be upbeat and contemporary or do you think they want to be authoritative? Okay, so here's the New York Times. Um, we look at the, at the top, their actual title there, that seems pretty serif-y. Uh, and if you look at the news stories here, you can see that they have serifs as well. Um, there is some sans serif. Uh, over on the right side, um, that whole sidebar is largely uh, sans serif. And up at the top, right underneath the name, the New York Times, if you just look at the world, US politics, New York, 
business, that's all sans serif as well. And so if we scroll a little bit further down the website, you'll notice that this web page is largely serifs. And the news articles themselves are serifs. And so that kind of makes sense. If you think about like what's New York Times probably trying to portray here, they're trying to portray that they are formal and authoritative. What about the Washington Post? So the Washington Post also largely uh, has a lot of serifs here. Um, although, again, as with the New York Times, if you look at underneath the, uh, the title there, uh, that bar going across the top in the news, coronavirus news, DC outbreak, and so on, that's sans serif. Um, you can see some other places where they're using sans serif. The writers of the articles, those names are um, sans serif. And if you look at the actual text, uh, of the articles here. If you look at that center, America's coronavirus divide, and you look at the text there, the question of whether or not the country should continue to stay at home, that's actually sans serif. All right, what about MSNBC? So they're trying to be more contemporary. Uh, I offhand do not see any serifs uh, on this web page at all. So that kind of got me thinking, like, I think MSNBC is a rather left wing. And so is there a difference between how left wing institutions and right wing institutions portray themselves? And so I thought we'd take a look at a couple think tanks here. Uh, the Brookings Institute, that's a center left think tank. And you can see that their name, Brookings there on the top left, that has Saris. But in fact, uh, their website largely, other than their name, uh, you know, which may have been... Uh, that, that font may have been chosen quite a while ago. Now, the rest of the website has no serifs at all. And then the Heritage Foundation, which is a conservative think tank, um, you can see that this is largely a serif website. There are some sans serif portions. So uh, running across the top there, about heritage events, renewed, donate, press, and contact, those all are sans serif, but... Their logo itself, the Heritage Foundation on the top left, and their main uh, article here, um, these all have uh, serifs. Okay, so based on what we know about uh, font choices, which uh, type of fonts do you think Apple Computer is going to use? And here we go. There are no <laughs> serifs here uh, on at the top of the Apple page. And if we scroll down even further, you can see, yeah, the, Apple has no serifs at all. They're, they want the contemporary upbeat look. They're not interested in being old school, authoritative, formal. No, not Apple. Okay, here's one more. Uh, the Mandarin Oriental New York. This is a five-star hotel in New York. What font choice do you think they would have? All right, and so here you go. Uh, this is largely serifs. And there is some sans serif. So if you look across the top there, um, their top bar does have sans serif font. And in fact, if you were to click on the menu, uh, that also has sans serif. But uh, the New York, as well as um, the rest of the website there, um, all has serifs. Okay, I mentioned monospace. So let's talk a little bit about monospace. Um, so your primary choices are serif or sans serif. Uh, there is another type of font, monospace, and actually monospace fonts can have serifs or they can be sans serifs. Um, in a monospace font, all the characters are the same width. So here I've got a non-monospace font, and notice M-I-W-I-M. -I -I notice that the I's are much, much narrower than the M's, which, you know, that's kind of what you'd expect. So uh, this font where... The M's and the I's are different sizes. This is referred to as a variable width or proportional font. In contrast, here's a monospace font. I've got M-I-W-I-M on the bottom there. And if you look, it's a little hard to tell for sure, but you can kind of see that the I's there are much wider so, uh, than with our non-monospace font. So um, M I. W-I-M, it looks like on the bottom font, those eyes are much wider than with the non-monospace font. And in fact, we can definitely see this if we reverse the letters here. So here's our variable width font, M-I-W-I-M, followed by I-M-I-W-I. -I -I. 
both these quote words have five letters each in them. And you could see that the second one, because it has a lot of eyes, which are super narrow, is much shorter than the top one. Now, if we switch to a monospace font, uh, you can see that these actually are both the same width. And so that's the basic idea behind a monospace font. All the characters are the same width. Monospace fonts are typically used to either represent program code or computer output. So you know, if we've got uh, our HTML source, I actually have not been using monospace for all of our code, mostly because monospace fonts take up a lot of space. Um, but uh, it's pretty common to use monospace for computer code. And in fact, if you look at an editor, for example, so here is here's Visual Studio Code and the default setting uh, on any one of these editors designed for programmer use is going to use some sort of a monospace font. It just makes it easier to get everything all lined up. Okay, so our next topic is choosing a color scheme. And in order to uh, understand how to choose a color scheme, uh, we actually need to learn a little bit more about color theory. So we've been using red, green, and blue RGB, and RGB is how the computer monitor actually creates colors, but there are other ways to be thinking about colors. And one of them is the hue, saturation, and brightness, or HSB scheme. And that's the one we're gonna be using. Okay, so the first part of HSB is the hue. And so the hue, you can kind of think of uh, hues as the colors of the rainbow or the colors of the color spectrum. And so that's what we're looking at here. Now, in addition to choosing a hue, I can also vary the saturation. So what we're seeing here is that uh, on the left, I have full saturation and I'm reducing the saturation. And on the far right, I have very little saturation. And if I reduce the saturation enough, I'm just gonna end up with white. In addition to controlling the saturation, I can also control the brightness. And so that's what we're seeing here on the far left. I have maximum brightness and uh, I'm getting less and less uh, light. And then on the far right, I have no brightness, which is basically black. Okay, so uh, as I suggested, RGB, that's how the computer display actually creates colors and HSB. Uh, is uh, a scheme that people often use to choose, determine what their color scheme should be. And so you may be wondering, well, what is the relationship between the RGB and the HSB that we're showing you now? And honestly, it's, there's just a simple mathematical formula to go from one to the other. So you know, the, we're not talking about creating different colors. We're just talking about a different way to be thinking about colors. So based on what we know so far, one possible color scheme uh, is to just choose a hue and then just to vary the color by uh, reducing the saturation or increasing or reducing the brightness. So this would be called a monochromatic color scheme. And this certainly works. And it's not going to look horrible, but it may not look that exciting either. So, you know, this may be, not be the way you want to go. Uh, for our other color schemes, uh, we want to understand a bit about how to choose the hue. and Typically, we're going to choose the hue by using what's called a color wheel. So let's go about creating a color wheel. I'm going to start off with our three primary colors. And remember, um, on the computer, we're using additive colors. So our three primary colors on the computer are red, green, and blue. And what, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix the colors. I'm going to mix each color with the color next to it. So I'm going to mix red with blue, getting some form of purple. I'm going to mix the green with the red and that will get me yellow and I will mix the uh, green with the blue and that, that will actually give me cyan. And by mixing each of the three colors with its nearest neighbor, that gives us the six color color wheel and that's what we're looking at here. And then I can do it again, which will get me the 12 color color wheel. And then I can keep on going as many times as I want. And in fact, um, if you were to take a look at Adobe Photoshop and, and many other painting programs, they have color wheels built in. So uh, the outer ring here, what we're seeing is uh, we're seeing the color wheel generated by over and over and over again, mixing the colors with its nearest neighbor until we get a continuous range of colors here. And then that triangle in the middle, that is actually uh, the saturation and brightness. So um, the bottom left is no brightness. Uh, and then the top left is no saturation. And so you can kind of play around with how much saturation versus brightness you want to get. Okay, so how are we going to use this color wheel to create color schemes? 
Well, there's a number of different color schemes one can create using the color wheel. Um, one color scheme choice, the simplest color scheme choice is complementary colors. And complementary colors, we take a color on one side of the color wheel and then we choose a color on the immediate opposite side of the color wheel. And so here we've got blue and yellow. And um, if you have any friends or you've got a brother or sister who's in one of the University of California schools, most of the University of California schools have some variation of this blue and, and yellow color scheme. So uh, Cal has dark blue and gold. Uh, the colors we're showing here are pretty close to UC Irvine colors. Uh, UCLA, I think, has more of a powder blue and, and uh, yellow or gold. Um, so these seem to work pretty well. On the other hand, if you kind of look at what this thing should match up with our cardinal red, well, as far as I can tell, this suggests that we should have some variation of cyan, uh, which I personally think that would look just awful. So, oh, well. But anyway, this is how you create a complementary color scheme. So another thing you could do, uh, if you want more than two colors, you can use a split complementary scheme. And so what happens here is I take a color on one side of the color wheel and I choose two colors on the opposite side of the color wheel. And you can kind of play around with the angle uh, between the two colors on the opposite side of the color wheel to get some different color schemes. Or you can have a triad color scheme where all three of the colors are equidistant across the color wheel. Or you can have an analogous color scheme where you're choosing colors that are near each other on the color wheel. Um, and you can kind of play around again with that angle there. Um, I've only got 12 colors, so there's not a whole lot you can do with the angle. But, you know, if you were to use that, uh, finer grain Photoshop color wheel with uh, the wide range of hues. Uh, you can play around with the angles and get uh, different analogous color schemes. Okay, um, the last thing I wanted to mention is layout and navigation issues. Uh, and so, you know, try to make sure when you're creating the web pages that uh, you have a clear idea on how people are gonna be navigating your website. Provide a clear sense on any single page on what else is available uh, on the website. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, remember, if you have a successful website, you are going to have people deep linking to your web pages. And so any one of your web pages should make it clear to whoever comes to visit that particular page that there's a lot of other stuff available on your website. You should make it very clear how to get to the home page and have some idea, give them some idea of what the other sections of your website are. Provide a consistent navigation scheme so you know, they don't have to, every time they go from one page to the next, be like, gosh, I, I don't understand what I'm supposed to click on to go somewhere next. And uh, don't have any dead end pages with no way out. This is something that, you know, I've, I've graded a lot of... Uh, <laughs> amateur websites over my time here at Stanford. And this is one of the things that I see a lot. I see both um, often people will have web pages that where it's not clear how to get to that web page. Um, and if we weren't actually counting up the files when we we're trying to grade their project, be like, hey, I've seen the other web page on the website. Look at, they've got this extra HTML file here. I wonder how I was supposed to get to that. You know, if it wasn't for the fact that we actually look at the HTML files, we wouldn't, you know, we just completely miss it. We start at the homepage, we visit all the pages that there's clear links to, and then you know, there's this extra page and, you know, nobody knows how to get to that. So uh, don't do that. A page that is not clear to, to people how to get to is pretty useless. And similarly, you don't want a page where somebody clicks on the page and the only way to get out of that page is to hit the back button because, you know, uh, if, if somebody ends up deep linked to that page, they're not going to be able to get away from that page. There's not going to be able to find a way to the rest of your website. So, you know, definitely don't do that. All right. So uh, that's it for our little talk on website design.